100 people register. So we're, we'll see how many show up. But it shows how people are excited about the topic tonight, as are we. Um, I'm joined by Billy Keating, who's going to help moderate and make sure all is uh, happening on the technology side. Um, and excited to have Christopher Brothers, who's a PhD candidate, share his excitement and knowledge and passion for dragonflies with us tonight. And Christopher is a PhD candidate at, uh, with the UC Davis Animal Behavior Group. So um, Christopher presented to our um, one of our docent training a uh, number of months ago, and Heidi found him catching dragonflies in the demonstration wetlands pond behind our office. So uh, we asked if he would you know, join us with, uh, for a part of our speaker series. So that's what's tonight. I wanna just give a quick preview. Uh, next month, uh, we have Eric Garrett Spann, who's the new area manager for the Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area. And um, Garrett's come to Fish and Wildlife from the feds. He worked at Sac Refuge for many years and uh, has a real vision for um, how to manage the wildlife area for all the different users, uh, from bird watchers to hunters to all the different people who enjoy the wildlife area. So we're looking forward to have him on next month. So what last thing before we get started is in the chat, we'd love to hear how you found out about this. If you found out about it through the UC Davis Listserv, if you found out about it through the Davis Enterprise, word of mouth, our newsletter, um, we'd love to improve our outreach um, and reach more people. So if you don't mind putting it in the chat, we'd love to hear from you about that. So without further ado, um, uh, oh, I'll just add that uh, Christopher is gonna run through his presentation and put your questions in the chat. And then at the end of his presentation, uh, we'll go through those, uh, those questions. So um, Christopher, you are ready to take it away? I guess I better be, huh? This, yeah. Well, hopefully there, there's a, I don't think you understand quite how much information I have tried to pack into this. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 different dragonfly books sitting next to me on my desk, not counting the three of them that are um, on campus. So um, I've really tried to get as much in here for everybody as possible. But um, yeah, so I might miss a couple things, but I don't think you guys will notice. So, um, but I think it'll be fine. So without further ado, um, my name is Christopher and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about uh, diversity, life cycle and leg use patterns of dragonflies, which are the world's most successful predators. Um, so here's a little outline of uh, kind of what I'm going to go through today. So we're going to talk about the order Odonata, which is the um, classification that makes up the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, we're going to talk about the life history and environments the dragonflies inhabit, um, unique features of the major families, um, a little emphasis on local species that we can find here around Yolo in California, um, a little brief insight into my personal research here at Davis, um, and some broader impacts on dragonflies, both uh, ecologically, but also in like some cultural mythos stuff, um, because there are other people throughout history that have loved them just as much as I have. So um, to start off, uh, the order Odonata is uh, what is uh, made up by the dragonflies and the damselflies. So here I've just got a quick little phylogenetic tree um, that shows uh, kind of some of the major groups of insects. Um, and really just emphasizing this is where dragonflies and damselflies are. Um, and this is basically representing a point uh, 300 million years ago where dragonflies and damselflies started evolving separately from the rest of insects. So they've been around for a very long time. They've been their own thing for many times more than uh, the amount of time that's passed since dinosaurs walked the earth. Um, and so just uh, for people that are not familiar or that have forgotten, um, just a little bit of a breakdown on what happens when I'm talking about uh, order or family, because I'll be referencing those words a lot here. Um, so those are just kind of points within the uh, binomial nomenclature or like two name system that we use to uh, refer to species. Um, and so above the genus, which is where kind of really close related species are connected, um, there's the family that still branches things out. Um, and then we go up one more um, into the order, which is where we're gonna be separating dragonflies and damselflies. Um, and one up from that in class is where you'd find things like mammals, insects, those kinds of classifications sort of like one step below that. Um, and so Odonata or the Odonates are within the order um, Odonata, but they're within the class Insecta. So they're insect, um, probably a long-winded explanation of that. But um, 
And then we also tend to add some extra categories here and I'll, I'll get to those in a bit. We've got suborders and super families and things, but it'll be, I think I'll mention them like once or twice and then we'll be good from there. Um, but so again, dragonflies and damselflies are about 300 million years old. Um, and I'll mostly focus on specifically the dragonflies today, um, but there are 64, um, hundred recognized species of dragonflies and damselflies. A little bit less than half of those make up the dragonflies. Um, there are three living suborders within that group. So there's the dragonflies themselves, the damselflies, and we have a weird little group that we call um, the dragon damsels, um, where they've kind of com like combined their Latin names um, into something that doesn't really make that much sense. Um, and so I'll talk briefly on all of them before really diving into dragonflies that are my true obsession. Um, but we can use the term odonate that kind of refers to the that order name of odonata um, to refer to all of them. So you don't always have to say dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, saves a lot of breath. So um, again, the um, dragonflies, uh, we call those anisoptera. When we look at the Latin thing, that's the name of their suborder. Um, and that translates specifically to unequal wing. Anis means uh, unequal or uneven. And optera is something that you'll see for wing. And that's in a lot of different common um, insect names. So for the zygoptera, which are the damselflies, we call those the equal wings, um, and that has to do with their wing shape. So the hind wings of dragonflies are more broad um, than the forewings, and so they're not shaped the same. But in damselflies, they tend to be pretty well the same. And then in the dragon damsels, uh, this would translate to unequal equal wing, which doesn't really make any sense and isn't technically one of their characteristics. Um, but it's just the kind of fusion of what those two are, because they're kind of an in-between group. They're slightly more related to dragonflies, but have a lot of damselfly-specific adaptations. Um, and I'll elaborate on those in a minute. But um, before we had the, the groups that we have now, um, there's an extinct like other offshoot of Odonata that we call the Meganisoptera or the griffinflies. Um, and these were back uh, during the times far before the dinosaurs, even before the rest of, of Odonata. Um, and they could be up to 71 centimeters long, so a little over uh, two feet. Um, so not something that you really want to have flying around. Uh, not even me. I don't think I really want an insect that big, um, to be honest. But um, they used to be much, much bigger than they are now. So if you see one now and you think it's really big, just think of how big they used to be. Um, so to start off, uh, we'll uh, kind of highlight the dragonflies. So um, in the dragonflies, there are 3,092 species. Those are separated into 11 different families. Um, we've got a couple that are really prevalent um, and others that we have very few representations of. There's one family that only has one and it's just so distinct genetically from all the rest of them um, that we have to separate it out because it just doesn't fit with anybody else. Um, and then there are three super families that we call um, these that are just basically how those families group together um, separately. So, um, um, and they uh, kind of share a lot of similar characteristics with each other. Um, but three within 11 is, is not too bad for dragonflies. Um, meanwhile, uh, these are the three families that make up the most diversity within dragonflies. Um, so there's about almost five. Yeah. Uh, so there's about almost uh, 500 species in the darners. Um, and there are just over a thousand in the club tails and the skimmers. Um, the skimmers being the biggest order, or sorry, the biggest family in all of Odonata. Um, and so kind of more emphasis placed on those ones because they're the kinds that you'll find the most often. Um, meanwhile, we get to the damselflies, um, and there are 3,217 species uh, known at this point. Um, the numbers won't completely match up for every little representation I have for species numbers. Uh, not all of the sources that have specifics are quite as up to date as each other. Um, and other people whose job it is to understand the relationship between these uh, different species aren't always all talking to each other at the same time, and I'm not one of them. So I can only kind of get that stuff secondhand. But uh, there's a, maybe a hundred or so more um, species of damselflies than dragonflies. Um, but for some reason, they're so distinct from each other that we have 27 different families, um, which is a lot. Um, and then those are only sorted into four super families where we have one that's by itself, four that are in one, three that are in another, and then 19 that they just haven't been able to separate. Um, and so there's just a little too much going on there. And uh, I think damselflies are amazing too. And there's a lot of things I would love to learn about them, but uh, I'm a little hesitant because there's a lot going on and uh, it's a bit too much even for me at this point. Um, and so I think a question that I get really, really often when I'm out um, talking about dragonflies and uh, also just out catching them in general 
um, is what's the difference between them. People will tell me that they see a uh, dragonfly doing some kind of thing. And then the more that they talk, the more I'm like, that's technically a damselfly. Um, and so outside of the US, I think dragonfly is really often used to refer to all um, species within the, the group. Um, but we're pretty well set on the dragonflies are one group and damselflies are the other group um, here within uh, the US. Um, and so this graphic from the uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust kind of really emphasizes that those big differences. So the broader wings in dragonflies, the kind of chunkier, more robust body, um, and the larger eyes that are closer together really resembles uh, or emphasizes what the dragonflies are. And they also can't fold their wings up. So they're always out when they're resting. Meanwhile, the damselflies are far more slender. Their eyes are separated. They don't really, they don't ever touch actually. Um, and they're just far more narrow and uh, could describe them as dainty, uh, but don't underestimate them because they're also ferocious predators. Um, and so here's just kind of a view from above, um, again, emphasizing like those three body regions that we see in insects um, and just how those, the shape of the head, thorax and abdomen differ, just far more robust in general in dragonflies. Um, and uh, again, we have those unequal shapes in the wings for the dragonflies and that same shape in those wings for the damselflies. Um, and I think I forgot to turn off these animations. But, um, and then lastly, just a nice up close visual of uh, the eyes of dragonflies and damselflies. Um, I have to say, I think damselflies are objectively way cuter. Um, they just look adorable and I would love to hug one, um, but they're also really tiny. So I don't think that would work out. Um, and so then lastly, now that we know the difference between those dragonflies and those damselflies, um, we have what we call the Anisozygoptera or the dragon damsels. Um, and there is one uh, family in there and there's one genus and they just kind of don't know what they're doing. This is a very robust organism with very large eyes um, that are closer together than damselflies are, but then they have wings that are shaped like dragonfly wings, but held like damselfly wings. Um, all of them live in Asia. There's only four species of them in total. And they're just slightly more related to dragonflies before branching off to do their own thing. Uh, there's fossil records of them being far, far more abundant in the past. So not really sure what uh, kind of reduced them to these numbers today, but um, they're really weird. I would love to see them sometime. Um, so one of these days, I'll hopefully take a, a research trip to um, some of the places that they're native to, but crazy things. So, um, but uh Odinates come in basically every single color of the rainbow. Um, and so they are called by um, some, especially uh, one of my mentors and uh, a famous dragonfly researcher that I look up to um, as rainbows on the wing. Um, and so here's a, a, an image from a paper that came out a couple years ago um, that's really focused on creating an open source database for understanding differences in the, the phenotypes or the visual um, expressions of um, dragonflies and damselflies. So lots of things on color, shape, um, behaviors, and such. Um, but for basically every color that we've got, we've got a dragonfly or a damselfly to represent it, which I think is really cool. Um, and so here we, I've got some that I arranged uh, kind of more just in a uh, rainbow shape. But um, some of these are, are native, especially uh, these three here. Um, and so they also have a very colorful mating style. So Dragonflies mate in what we call the wheel position. Um, so these most of these colors are for either recognizing the same species or for some kinds of mating displays um, where the male will um, dance to attract the um, female, although there's some that reverse that pattern that we kind of hold as normal in um, natural world, um, but animals like to do what they want to do. Uh, but so there's a strange arrangement of the genitalia within dragonflies that I won't get into here, but um, basically is uh we've got the male here that grasps the head of the female and then she curls her abdomen that um kind of tail looking uh segment up um and that's how they uh fertilize eggs and then um here we've got two that are depositing uh the females depositing eggs while they're still what we call in tandem where they're connected to each other um <clears throat> and so we see that these are really colorful um and vibrant creatures that fly all over the sky um but those uh colors aren't there for long. Um, so dragonflies actually spend the majority of their life underwater um, in this larval stage. And so they kind of look like these, it's a simile of, uh, I think, uh, alien rejects is, uh, I think, a, a term that has popped up a couple times as I've talked about this. Um, and so these larvae, um, also called nymphs uh, in some texts, uh, are really cryptically colored. So they tend to be like a brown, a green, a tan kind of color. Um, and so they don't 
have any of the coloration that we expect in the adults um, in these uh, aquatic stages. Um, and they can come in all shapes and sizes, as you can tell from uh, this arrangement of these larval stages. Um, and so again, they're also called nymphs and naiads. Uh, there are some odontologists or dragonfly researchers that have very strong opinions on whether we should use the term nymph or naiad for them. Um, I am not one of them. I don't really care. But um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting where scientists will draw the line and what they're okay with. Um, and so these red ones emphasize that they're larvae of the damselflies. Um, so we can see these cool uh, like leaf-like gills that extend from the end of their abdomen. Um, whereas in dragonflies, they're uh, kind of all parts that make up what we call an anal pyramid that um, kind of opens and closes. Um, so dragonflies are aquatic insects. Uh, they spend most of their time in this uh, aquatic stage and the larvae can inhabit various different uh, freshwater ecosystems. So like still and flowing water, ponds and, and lakes are big ones, but streams and rivers are also places that they can call home. Um, and they can live kind of within the vegetation among the substrates at the bottom. So mud, uh, gravel, rocks, things like that. Um, and uh, in this stage, uh, they are also predators. So they're what we call obligate predators, which means that uh, the only thing that they do is eat other organisms. There's no other kind of diet alternative for them. Um, so they're really only geared for catching that and only geared for digesting that. Um, so you'll never see them trying to eat plant material or anything of the like. Um, and they mostly will feed on aquatic invertebrates. So um, sometimes they'll eat other species or even the same species um, as themselves, uh, but often things like the larvae of mayflies, some aquatic worms, um, Daphnia, which are little water fleas, um, and other things like that that live underwater, but they'll also sometimes catch small fish. Um, there's a species of fish called a stickleback that people tend to know about that uh, grows like protective spines so that um, fish aren't able to swallow them. Um, but they won't do that around dragonflies because then the dragonflies will just grab onto that spine and eat them up. Um, and they're pretty solid predators here too. Um, they have a 65% capture success, which is Sounds like it's not a great uh, score to get on a standardized U.S. test, but it's actually really, really good for a predator. Um, and so depending on the species, um, dragonfly larvae will spend about from a few months to up to five years before emerging as adults kind of tends to be the, the average window. But we've also got some extremes there. Um, the shortest recorded being a uh, species in the genus Pantala um, that are the gliders and uh, the record being held by um, some in the genus Epiophlebia, which is those dragon damsels that we mentioned before. Um, so that's what those adults look like. Um, Pantala specifically being present on every single continent around the world. This is the one that's called the globe skimmer and migrates. Um, and so they've got a really fast turnaround um, on their life cycle. Uh, one of the really cool, unique adaptations that dragonflies have are their labial mask, um, or uh, the labium is, is the, the name of uh, one of those uh, mouth parts in insects. And in the larval stage of dragonflies and damselflies, it's been modified um, into this extendable organ that they use to grab prey. Um, so they can extend it up to about half of their body length and grab things in the water and pull it back to where their actual mouth is. Um, and so it kind of serves as a fork and a plate all in one. Um, and it's a very fast organ too. So it can accelerate. Um, this is technically written in uh, the units for velocity and I'm not truly a physicist or a biomechanist, but um, it moves very quickly. Um, and they can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, this one you see here has got um, kind of these scissor teeth um, at the end of those movable hooks. Um, these ones are actually kind of uh, just like sharp for puncturing. Um, and then this is what some of them look like in damselflies. Um, and so there's been some recent work that's actually uncovered the mechanism of how this thing works. Uh, we were wrong for a long time. And I thought I was going to um, try to uncover this as part of my PhD work. Um, but about as soon as I got to graduate school is when uh, they started releasing that they'd figure this out. Um, so we assumed it was uh, it functioned hydraulically for 100 plus years. Um, there's a French guy um, that kind of proposed that back in like 1881. Um, hydraulic meaning there's a buildup of pressure that allows it to, to launch forward. Um, but uh, it's now described as a dual catapult system, kind of with some internal musculature um, and other like uh, shapes of body parts that allow it to like latch and then release and it's got a, a fancy mechanism um i don't really understand it enough to talk about it and uh i've read many many papers on it so i'm not going to try and butcher it today um but again it's really fast so uh we have to use high speed cameras to really like actually measure anything about it other than just seeing that it happened um because they can grab something and pull it back to their mouth 
and a third of a second. So blink and you miss it um, quite literally. Um, so here's a video of um, a blue dasher, which is a common species we have around here. Um, a uh, One of my lab mates um, was studying them for a project um, and took this high-speed video. Um, and hopefully that wasn't jumpy for everybody else, but I'm going to play that back one more time. Um, Um, yeah, but I think that was slowed down at least 200 times. Um, so very, very fast motion. Um, and so uh, all dragonflies and amplifies will use this organ, that Lego mask, um, as they hunt prey in their larval stage. Um, and so there's two different foraging modes that they will fall into. These are also pretty archetypical of, um, or they're, they're pretty representative of just how the two different main ways that predators in general in the animal kingdom will hunt. Um, so there's the sit and wait or ambush predators. Um, in adult dragonflies, we call them perchers, and I'll explain that a bit in, uh, later. Um, but they uh, kind of sit uh, in an area and they wait for things to come to them. Um, so very on the nose uh, explanation. Um, and so this is a libellulid uh, imp. Um, and then there's the active predators or the pursuit predators that tends to to follow after um, certain uh, prey and the adult form of this we call flyers and dragonflies specifically. Um, but so here's one, uh, a dragonfly actually hunting a damselfly. Um, and you can see it's aiming for it specifically. So it had, before the skiff was uh, taken, would have moved towards it um, in order to capture it. Um, and so the ones that take up the sit and wait predator um, foraging mode they usually tend to be sedentary, so they'll, they won't move around very much. Um, and they'll kind of sit atop things or they'll be burrowers. So they'll kind of hide themselves under sand, rocks, some other kind of substrate. Um, and in a lot of them, they start to rely more on their tactile senses um, in this stage. So they, they wait for vibrations, the movement of water, things to actually touch the sensory hairs that they have on their bodies. Um, and so uh, because of that, they tend to have eyes that are on the smaller side. Um, they're not using their visual um, fields as much. Meanwhile, in the active predators, it's kind of the opposite. Um, so they move around a lot in search of their prey um, and tends to pursue or stalk their prey before capturing them um, so that they can line up that perfect shot. Um, and they're very visually responsive. I've had a couple of these um, in the lab over the years while I've worked on uh, my PhD. Um, and you can see them kind of slowly turn and start stalking towards the other side of the container you've got them in when they start to notice motion. Um, and so they usually have larger eyes um, and I just imagine being the size of something that it can eat and just having this approach you. Um, it is very unsettling uh, in the most fascinating way, but I'm weird and I study predation. So, um, And then one thing that always blows people's minds as I talk about it is that uh, the larvae have anal gills. Um, so for their respiration, their ability to draw oxygen out of the water, um, their internal anal gills that we see in dragonflies um, and their abdomen is tipped with what we call the anal pyramid. So there's uh, a couple of different segments that open it up and allow them to exchange um, water in and out that pulls oxygen in and out of the air or out of the water. Um, and then um, shout out to damselflies that have these nice, pretty leaf-like um, gills at the end um, that a lot, they also can use to, to stir up um, the water as well. Um, but the anal pyramid um, setup in dragonflies is especially cool because it lets them do something else unique, um, which is something that we call anal jet propulsion, which is a hilarious sentence to say in any uh, context, but especially in a biological one, um, because they essentially just eject water from their anus. Um, it is a predator escape response. It allows them to move themselves out of the way of danger. Um, and it can it goes like typically about 10 or so times their body length that they'll be able to, to move. Um, so really easy way to get away from fish or things that want to eat them. Um, but uh, what I've found is that it also uh, allows them uh, some stability during their labial strikes. Um, oh. There we go. Um, so this is a video of the common whitetail dragonfly nymph. Um, and so you see this one attempting to catch some uh, prey that's swimming by and failing, um, but shortly after it releases its labium off to the side, um, there's this jet of water that had ejected out of its um, anus that is kind of helping to keep it stabilized in place as it hunts. So I think that's really cool. 
Um, and then lastly, you talked a little bit about uh, their ability to, to breathe with their um, anal or rectal gills. Um, and so one of the cool things is before they finally um, finish developing enough to exit the water, um, the nymphs of dragonflies will actually start to breathe bimodally. So they'll breathe some of their um, oxygen in through uh, their anal gills, um, but they'll have what we call spiracles on the back of their um, thorax um, that actually start to function um, before they become adults. Um, adult uh, insects all breathe through spiracles. Um, those are basically openings directly into the respiratory system, um, which is a tracheal system. It's basically just tons of uh, um, hollow tubes that run through the body that allow them to circulate um, oxygen. And so they don't actually use their um, blood or their hemolymph um, for that at all. So that's really cool. Um, but they start kind of changing that up before they're ready to um, emerge. So then once they're done developing, um, they can just climb right out and they're able to breathe as they do that. Um, and so uh, last thing about the, the nymphs before we um, take to the skies um, is that they're kind of preparing to be ready to wing it. Um, so they have what we call wing sheaths on the back. Um, and so I've got them circled here, um, but they are basically storages for the wings as they develop in their larval stage. And they grow uh, larger as they develop further and further along in this stage. And so they can help us indicate their maturity of um, these organisms. So we can basically, there'll be different sizes at different stages and we can use those proportions to understand just how old um, some of those nymphs are. Um, but these sheaths keep the wings safe as they um, develop. So that way, once they're done um, and they uh, leave the water to emerge as adults, they can just pop them right out um, and then they'll pump them up with some, some liquid. Um, and that's when they make their way up to the new world. So this is a kind of graphic I'll walk everyone through on just kind of the whole life cycle of dragonflies. So starting with those mating uh, in the wheel position that we talked about earlier. Um, so the uh, male and female are in this position to mate. Um, then the female goes to deposit her eggs either in the water, sometimes straight into aquatic vegetation. Some of them will do it into like woody plants. Uh, there are a couple other strange environments that they do this in. Some lay it in uh, saltwater marshes. There's a couple that will lay it in um, aquatic plants or in like wood filled tree holes where they kind of grow up in these really, really small environments. Um, then the uh, emerging nymphs um, come out. And so we've got this cute little one here that turns into the nymph down there. Uh, and those eggs typically hatch after a week or so. Um, then uh, they'll go through a couple different stages of development here. Um, before finally finishing up um, so that they can emerge, changing their ability to breathe kind of in between, and then they'll come up here. And this is when they um, will uh, break out of the back of their um, last exoskeleton and start to puff up their wings. And it takes them a couple, uh, takes them a couple different, or a couple uh, hours to actually harden their exoskeleton. It tends to be soft when they first come out because they've Kind of grown too large for their own skin essentially and then they uh with their wings pump up they dry out um, and then they get ready to take off um, and a lot of different species will change color over time so they gain their colors after they actually break out of their um, larval stage and so my favorite thing to tell people about dragonflies and dragonfly adults um, is that they are the most successful predators on the planet um, I typically will say empirically because we have measured this. Um, there are three different species of dragonflies that have a 97% success rate. Those are the Eastern pond hawk um, that's native to uh, Eastern, the Eastern US, uh, the blue dasher that's native to everywhere in the US, um, and the dot-tailed white base that we can find in a lot of different places. Um, and uh, we've also got three different species that are known to capture hummingbirds, which is, it's always crazy to think of an invertebrate catching a vertebrate. Uh, but dragonflies are so good at what they do that they got tired of just insects. So on the top left, we have the dragon hunter that is uh, native to the Northeast US. We have the swamp darner um, on the top right uh, that kind of has a distribution all across the um, like Eastern US. And then we have the common green darner down at the bottom, which is native everywhere. So we have them too. Um, and they are very ferocious predators. Uh, when it comes to vision, that's the bread and butter of adult dragonflies. So uh, 
Dragonflies have the largest eyes of any insect. So there's 30,000 omatidia, or what we call the simple eyes within um, their compound eyes, um, which gives them about 360 degrees of vision. Uh, it also allows them to really get great depth perception of things that they're viewing. So they can detect really tiny prey against the vast blue sky, kind of what they're specialized for. They can also basically determine from almost any distance if uh, prey is going to be close enough for them to chase, but also if it's of the right size that they want to hunt. Uh, a lot of them have a special range in which they're really specifically wanting to um, hunt different types of prey. So they kind of will discriminate against um, if that prey is uh, of the right size and category that they want to hunt. They're also able to see into the UV spectrum and uh, they can see the color red, which doesn't sound that impressive because all of us can do that. Well, most of us can do that, but that's not really the case for insects. The The wavelengths so have that kind of spectrum down at the bottom. The wavelengths of red tends to be too big for insects to see. So a lot of them like bees are not capable of seeing that. But dragonflies really, really bet all of their cards on vision. Uh, if you can see through this kind of background image I have here, uh, these are the antennae of dragonflies and they're really, really small and really, really reduced. So you can't see them uh, very easily from a distance. And it's because really all of their worldview is view. They, they only um, take in visual information for the most part. Um, but all right. Um, when it comes to, to flight, dragonflies are also kind of kings when it comes to that. So this is just an image of the wings of a dragonfly. So kind of two things to point out. There's tons of different vein patterns, and those help us uh, understand a bit of the evolutionary history and relatedness of species. But over time, we started to learn that that's not the most reliable because a lot of times the shape of the wing will change based on the different environments that different species are inhabiting. And so it's not always the most uh, effective and consistent measure. But um, we have two points basically, which are of interest, which is the notice, um, which is a part where the, the wing is able to flex. Um, and then the pterostigma here, which is a kind of colored in darker patch on the wing near the end. Um, and in dragonfly specifically, it is a point that's heavier than the rest. So it allows them to balance uh, and control their wings better. Um, and so when it comes to flying, dragonflies uh, have only what we call direct flight muscles. So they have muscles for flying that are directly connected to the base of their wings, and they don't have indirect muscles. So most other insects will fly using what we call indirect flight muscles, where they're able to basically use their those muscles to deform their thorax or kind of flex it in a way that allows them to move their wings that way instead. Um, it can be energetically less um, costly than directly controlling their wings and also allows them for some cool alternative ways of, of firing their nerves to get them to, to flap faster than they could do it with um, the way that nerves work. But um, dragonflies are stuck with just the direct flight muscles, but it gives them some cool advantages, including independent control of each of their wings. So they can move each wing uh, by itself in any way that they want which allows them to fly in all directions or what we call omnidirectional flight. It allows them to basically uh, hover near motionlessly and allows them to take acute turns at high speeds. And they're really, really um, great at navigating in the air. Uh, I don't know if you've seen other insects like beetles try to fly. They're not, not nearly as graceful. Then uh, there's also tends to be a lot of coloration on uh, wings. And those are typically for different, uh, species to recognize each other, but also sometimes used in mating displays, although that tends to be a bit more common in the damselflies. So getting into foraging of uh, dragonflies. So again, we've got those two main categories of foraging, so sit and wait predators and the active predators. And they're what we call the perchers and salliers for the sit and wait predators and um, flyers or hawkers for um, the active predators. And so, uh, Highlighting a little bit of mostly dragonflies still, but um, gleaners or the gleaning mode is something that only damselflies do. So perchers, and I'll let this video start over from the beginning, but they tend to uh, sit on a perch and wait for prey to fly by close enough that they can take off and grab it. And then they tend to return to that same perch and do that all day long. So they really like their perch and perching is what they do. Um, most of the predation contexts of, or most predation studies in dragonflies have focused on perching species. Then we have the flyers. This is unfortunately not a video, it's just a GIF. Um, the flyers tend to fly 10 feet in the air or higher. Um, and it's really hard to figure out what they're doing when they're up there. 
Um, they also really don't like to be contained. So they would they would like the entire sky and nothing less. So we don't actually study them as directly um, in these contexts, but they tend to spend most of their time on the wing, um, patrolling areas and things like that. And then lastly, we have gleaning. So this is a strategy that's only seen in damselflies, uh, but damselflies are less studied in the context of predation um, as of now. Uh, I'm hoping to change that myself going forward, but um, for now I'm still uh, in team dragonfly. But gleaning is something that we call basically plucking uh, prey off of a surface. So they'll tend to, to grab different things off of leaves, off of the ground, off of rocks. Um, but uh, some damselflies will also do what we call perching or sallying. Um, and so with that, I'm um, going to dive into a little bit on the specifics of these 11 families that we started with um, and get an understanding of what makes the dragonfly families unique. Um, unfortunately, there are a couple where there's not that much that we know, uh, at least not that's specific enough to be talking about today. But um, we'll be focusing on, uh, there'll be some that will have a lot more to, to talk about. Um, so uh, first up, we have the Darners, or family Asia Day. There's about 488 species in here. Um, and they're known for having really, really long abdomens and very large eyes. Uh, they're often flyers. I think they're actually entirely flyers. They tend to patrol really large areas that they'll fly around at. I've spent a lot of time at North Star Park collecting different types of dragonflies, mostly focusing on perchers for my research, but it's really cool to see different darner species kind of competing with each other over uh, this, the airspace and oftentimes chasing away some of the, the darner species or the um, percher species as well. The males tend to be really blue and blue is kind of a generally very common color in dragonflies. There's different mechanisms by which that color pops up, but of the dragonfly species, darners are especially um, likely to be blue. And they most often tend to inhabit lakes and ponds. They're sometimes in streams, but they tend to um, be there a little bit less often. And at the bottom left, I have an example of uh, what the nymph stage of a um, darner looks like. And then on the right, we have uh, a resident California species. This is the giant darner uh, in X Walsingham I. Uh, and it is the largest species in North America. It gets to, I think, about four inches. So uh, I'm not exactly sure where they live. I know of some people that have gone to try to find them and haven't quite, but they are around. So next up, we have the um, Astropitalidae, which is a family of only 11 species. They are native to Chile, Argentina, and Australia. They used to be part of the Neopitalidae, but they don't really have a common name because there's so little that we know about them aside from that there are multiple. Um, the bottom left, I have uh, an example of just a sketch uh, scientific illustration of their larval stage. And then here's an example of uh, one of the species, the alpine red spot. Um, but really not too much that we understand about these guys. There's a lot of gaps that we still need to fill in on different things about different species. Next up is the gomphidae or the club tails. This is the second largest species uh, in uh, Anisoptera or within the dragonflies. So there's 1,009 species. They tend to have uh, smaller eyes that are pretty well separated, so they don't touch at the top of the head. They tend to be perchers, so they are either perching flat or with their abdomen up in the air. And they're known for their abdomen that often expands near the tip of it. So they've got basically this little club um, shape at the end, and they mostly inhabit streams and rivers. Um, and then this is a picture of the dragon hunter, Guinea's brevistylus, um, which is my favorite species in the family Gomphidae. Um, it does have a kind of scary name, and that's because it's well known for eating other dragonflies and damselflies. But it's also one of those species I mentioned earlier that has captured hummingbirds. Um, and it's also known for eating monarch butterflies and other uh, large insects. Next up, we have the petal tails, or the petaluridae. So there's 11 species in this family. Uh, they're named for the petal-shaped circe, or those, those are the claspers at the end of the abdomen in males that are used for grasping females for mating. And so we can see those kind of down here next to the name of this giant petal tail. And so these are basically all perchers. So they'll, they'll perch on things. Um, these ones will often actually perch on the side of trees rather than on like kind of uh, shoots or grasses. And they have semi-terrestrial larvae. So they have ones that will burrow kind of in mud or live under like uh, leaf litter that tends to be damp year round. Um, and so they're, they're kind of like almost not aquatic, but they still are. And there are two species that we have in the US. Um, the larval stage here is at the, the bottom left. And on the right, we have the giant petal tail, which is actually the largest species of dragonfly in the world uh, with a wingspan of six and a half inches 
and four and a half uh, inches in length. And this one is native to Asia. But uh, of the two species we have in the US, there's the black petal tail that we have um, on this side in the West. And there's a interesting story uh, connecting them to Bigfoot that I'd be happy to talk about later, but it's kind of wild. Next up, we have the Chlorogonfidae or the tiger bodies. There are 52 species in this group, and they're known for having abdomens with kind of that are black with golden rings around them. Not too much is known about their foraging mode, but their wings tend to have um, colors of whorls of orange, yellow, and black. Um, again, nymph is in the bottom right corner, or bottom left corner. And here's uh, two of them uh, mating. Next up, we have the Cordula gastridae or the spike tails. And these are really named for the extra long ovipositors that they have um, in the females. That are um, An ovipositor is a hollow tube um, kind of at the end of the abdomen that is used for depositing eggs. So it's really all it's for, but these ones tend to be really sharp to break through aquatic vegetation. Oftentimes, uh, people mistake ovipositors for stingers. And that's not something that dragonflies are capable of doing. Dragonflies don't have venom in any capacity, but the stingers of bees and wasps are actually modified ovipositors. So over evolutionary time, because social insects, the workers don't actually reproduce. They don't need to lay any eggs because they don't make any. So instead, they actually use it to deliver venom. And so it's a common thing that people get uh, mixed up, but these ones probably would still hurt. Uh, these also tend to be perchers, and we don't really know that much else about them. At least I don't, um, but uh, it's kind of made me determined to learn a bit more about some of these other ones where I really didn't have that much to say. So, and then here's just the one example of uh, a spike tail species. Then we have probably the weirdest family within the dragonflies, uh, the Neopetalidae. The Ostropetalidae used to be part of this, and then they separated it out and just left this one by itself. Um, so, He's just a lonely, cute little bug, but they're known for these unique spot patterns that they have, which you can see kind of in this slide background um, here, but they, we don't really know that much about this one that's been left on its own, except that it's native to Argentina and Chile. Um, we call it either the red spot or the spot wing, but that's about all there is to it. Um, now we've got the skimmers, which is the largest family of uh, odonates in general. There's 1,033 species in here, um, and they actually have both foraging modes. So they have perchers that perch horizontally, and they have flyers that tend to hang down from plants. So they live in a wide variety of, of habitats and hunt prey of various different sizes. Uh, on the right here, we have a picture of the slender skimmer, which is native to Sri Lanka, but it's my favorite within this family because it is known for voraciously hunting, or voraciously hunting uh, other odonates. So lots of different damselflies and dragonfly species, including itself. So really cool. And also there's something really elegant, I think to me about the, the black and white striped abdomen um, that tapers off of the green. Then we have next the cordulids or the emeralds. So there's 165 species in this group. They're named for their really striking green eyes and they tend to be only flyers and they mostly inhabit lakes and ponds. Um, on the right here, we have the Heinz emeralds and they tend to not have um, very much of a stripe on their um, thorax, whereas most other species tend to have two in their coloration. But then here we have the cruisers, so the Macromiidae. There's 124 species here. They're known for only having one stripe on their thorax in this part, and they're all flyers. Uh, this is the Western River Cruiser, which is native to um, Yolo. Um, and also, I think there's just something really cool about the name Macromia Magnifica. It just sounds very regal. Um, and they're called cruisers because they tend to just fly straight down the middle of bodies of water um, and in more urban environments down uh, the middle of roads. And their eyes just barely meet at the tippy top. And they have uh, these weird kind of sprawling shaped nymphs down here at the bottom. And then I believe this might actually be our last family. Um, I'd kind of lost count. Sorry about that. Uh, but these are the uh, Synthemistidae or the tiger tails. And there's 150 species here. They're named for uh, the patterns on their abdomen. And their foraging mode is not really clear. I think they're probably most likely to be flyers, but I don't actually know enough about them to say it for sure. But they tend to prefer marshy areas and fast streams. And they tend to be really small or on the smaller side with a narrow waist um, between their thorax and their abdomen. So. 
Um, and so here we've got uh, kind of an ILAT naturalist uh, survey of the dragonflies within Yolo County. So most of them are going to be Libellulidae. Um, it's almost like it's the largest family or something. Um, and so we've got, um, yeah, so we've got mostly Libellulidae, a couple different genera there. Um, and then we've got three different species in the family Aeshidae and four in the family Gompidae. I've actually not seen any of the gompins that we have locally um, in the four years that I've been here. So uh, clearly I need to go searching for those this summer. Um, and then we have one from Macromiidae and that's the Western River Cruiser, which I've also not seen, but uh, I would love to try and see this summer. And so here's all the ones that I have actually witnessed in the time that I've been here. So about half of them. So I clearly need to be uh, on the lookout for some. And then uh, just because they're also beautiful and worth uh, noting, even though I don't know nearly as much about them, uh, here's a survey of the damselflies that we have here in Yolo County. So they're mostly in one of those um, big families, but we've got kind of one representative and a different one. Uh, I think the last time I gave this talk, I was only aware of four of these being present. And clearly I missed quite a few. Um, but so these are the five that I've actually seen here. Um, so less than half on my damselfly survey. So. I really need to kick it up a notch. Um, and so now that I've talked to you for what, 40, almost 50 minutes straight about dragonflies, um, we've talked about how they're empirically the most successful predators on the planet, um, catching tons of different prey with a 97% capture success rate. Uh, we've talked about their incredible vision that allows them to see and discriminate tiny prey against uh, the blue sky and determine so many different colors. We talked about their omnidirectional flight and their ability to um, fly and turn uh, in amazing ways. We've talked about their complex mating behaviors and uh, the ways in which they find each other in display. Um, we've also talked about their unique adaptation in the labial mask, this little alien mouth that sets them apart as predators, um, and even their anal jet propulsion that allows them to navigate through the water and escape predators in these fascinating ways. Um, and so you'll probably remember that part of the talk title is talking about legs and those patterns. Um, and so the question now is what's up with those legs? So looking at them in adults, um, they have some purposes, but legs are probably the most ignored part of a dragonfly or a damselfly. There's only a couple papers on them. Um, I'm now kind of obsessed with them and focusing on them for my PhD, but uh, there's not that much that we know about them. So we know that they're used for eye cleaning. Um, they're these modified combs on the, the front legs that allow dragonflies to kind of wipe things off of their eyes and keep them clean. Again, when that's your main sensory organ, you really want to be able to see. Um, they're also important for perching. They'll use it to grasp onto the things that they're perching from uh, for their takeoff and landing. Um, but the real kicker is that they're the primary capture organ. So not so much when they're larvae, but as adults, when they're moving around with their wings, the legs become the prime thing to restrain prey. And so that's a really important thing to consider, especially when we look at predators as successful as these. These legs, really important. Um, and so here's just a quick close-up video of a blue dasher from one of my lab mates' uh, projects. Um, this one chasing a bead on a string. So, and this is the blue dasher, which is one of those three species with a 97% capture success rate. Um, but then let's let's go back to the nymphs though. Uh, so the the nymphs have their legs, um, but they're using them to move around. So they're I mean the main form of locomotion. It's kind of costly to always be ejecting water, so um, they will tend to walk around and burrow. Um, they also use them for prey detection. So some of them are really sensitive um, on their legs, and those are are how they detect um, prey around them to um, strike at. Um, but they're also really important for uh, stability when they emerge. So there are a lot of species that will wrap their legs around um, reeds or other aquatic vegetation um, to secure themselves so that they can uh, actually safely uh, complete their metamorphosis to emerge as their adult stage. And so one of the things that I've learned looking at these uh, over time is that there's a pretty good chance that the legs are also really important for stability during prey capture and these nymphs. Um, so they tend to be really successful when they are stable. Like this Asia nymph here, that's got a good, um, uh, kind of a good anchoring on this rock, um, and they tend to miss when they're not. So you see this one having to kind of readjust itself as it's flailing around because it was not all stable. And so that's one of the things that I'm studying for uh, my PhD, one of my projects. So 
Um, Dragonfly nymphs have this really wide capture range. Um, and every time I feel like I'm going to try and update these videos to new ones and just don't get around to it, but these ones do the job pretty well. Um, and you can see that uh, anal jet there. Um, and then this is that uh, other video from earlier. Kind of turning off to the side. Um, and so what I'm investigating is kind of how different substrates or those things at the bottom, so gravel, sand, mud, um, affect the capture success of dragonfly larvae. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in um, looking at capture success on different substrates. So I've kind of started with just a rough or slippery substrate, um, one of them denoted by glass for this um, slippery substrate and uh, kind of a sandpaper skateboard grip tape for a rough substrate. Um, and trying to understand the contribution of legs to prey capture here because they're not yet the main thing that they catch prey with but they're still kind of important for that. Um, and so that's what I've been uh, investigating, but um, I've been mostly focusing on one of the local species, the flame skimmer, um, Livulua saturata. It's got this vibrant, um, beautiful adult form, and it's very easy to identify as a nymph, at least for me. It took me a while, maybe like two years, but now I can tell them pretty well. Um, and they're really locally abundant as well. Um, and because they are in that sit and wait category, they don't really want to move too much, so you can plop a camera right above them and they'll just stay there and it's nice and convenient. Um, uh, and so some of the nymphs that I've used for this over the years, I have collected from the Yolo Basin Foundation. So here's a couple photos of me running around the demonstration wetlands um, looking for nymphs. I don't think I actually managed to get any on this particular trip, um, but I have gone a couple times and I'm very thankful for that because it's always a fun time to go there and obviously very helpful to uh, my research. Um, and so I'm hoping to get some of my results out this year. I've got a lot of videos to sort through, um, and I got to make sure that they worked before figuring out if I need to maybe redo some things, but, um, I've learned a lot and I've enjoyed, um, investigating this stuff. Um, but so going back to the adults, um, again, we've covered that they're the main, uh, tool that they use to capture their prey is with their legs. And so all adult dragonflies have leg spurs. So these basically spikes that come off of the legs. And that's the same for damselflies, except for a few different groups, one of them called the, the bare legs that just completely lack spurs at all, which don't know how and why, but one day I'd like to figure out. Um, but on here, this segment of the leg is called the tibia. And so I specifically have been focusing the last couple of years on the tibial spurs. So these spurs down here at the end, those are um, kind of the ones that will most closely wrap around prey when they grab them out of the air. And so understanding um, several different things about them is really important for predicting uh, the behaviors of these predators. And so I've been looking at uh, size, shape, facing patterns, and counts of these spurs on different species um, and asking kind of the broad question are, uh, of, are some patterns associated with certain behaviors? So looking at uh, if they can help us predict the percher versus uh, flyer foraging type and also prey size preference. Again, there's a lot that we don't know about some of these different species. So trying to fill in those gaps is really important. And so uh, what we can do is we can take museum specimens um, and things and compare those to known behaviors. So we can identify if there's correlations between different types of, of patterns of these leg spurs and different types of behaviors. And then that allows us to take that and then use it to predict that about harder to study species. Some of those species are really rare. And so we might have a couple specimens somewhere in the world that someone has saved, but actually being able to observe them and uh, study their behavior is really, really difficult, especially when they're in really hard to reach places. So getting equipment out there to actually record things um, is really difficult. And so if we can find these patterns in species that are easier to access, it becomes really fruitful. Um, and so in order to do that, um, I employ what we call the phylogenetic method, par um, comparative method. So uh, I account for the shared evolutionary history of different species um, by using a big, big phylogeny that someone else has put together and that I am very thankful for um, in the collaborative nature of science. Um, and I pick species on which we have no knowledge for behavior and uh, take a look at the morphology of their legs. And I use and compare that behavioral data from the literature um, with it. And so we compare it with those different um, foraging modes. Um, and we can also take a look at ones where they've 
uh, kind of either cut off the options for prey size or have investigated the diets of specific species so that we can tell if those patterns of the legs also uh, inform us if something is a large or a small prey specialist, like the dragon hunter that I emphasized um, or the green darner that I've got behind me up here. Um, those are large prey specialists, so we really only see them with big things. And then there's other species that we really only see with small things. The blue dasher is one of those. Um, and so in order to get that, uh, those types of morphological data, I tend to take it from uh, museum assessments. So I work very closely with the Bohart Museum of Entomology here at Davis, um, which also does a lot of uh, public facing events. So if I've gotten you incredibly curious about dragonflies over this talk or insects in general, um, we've got tons of events uh, happening all the time. So feel free to come and give us a visit. Um, to get some of those measurements more in detail, uh, I employ uh, some nice fancy technology known as micro CT scanning. Um, and so this is what those, uh, this is what specimens look like in the CT scanner. I've had to 3D print a mount to put them all together so I can make sure I don't damage the specimens from the museum and uh, basically use x-ray beams to turn this into a um, 3D image. Um, and so this is uh, kind of what one of my um, CT scans looks like animated. So um, basically just getting it to, to rotate, but I can look at all of these things in uh, detail and in three dimensions um, and get a really good idea for kind of how these uh, leg spurs are oriented relative to each other, um, kind of the angle of the branch off from each other, because that's looking like it's really important for understanding if they're intended for capturing small or large prey. Um, and there we go. Um, and so this is just a CT scan of the tibial segment of the leg. Um, and that is of the green darner, which is in the top right corner and also behind me on my zoom screen. And so um, what we're, what I'm predicting is uh, that the smaller angle between these um, rows, so there's two rows on each leg, uh, the closer together those rows are, the larger the prey they're intended for because it allows the insect to basically puncture into the prey and hold onto it. But those wider angles, um, we've got some that are like 120 degrees from each other. Um, and those are more intended for just surrounding something small like a mosquito or a fly uh, so that they can just contain it and funnel it towards their mouth. And, um, and so looking at the, the broader impacts of my, my research, I'm kind of obsessed with these guys, which is why I've been talking about them uh, with no fatigue for about an hour straight. But uh, there's a lot of potential for using them to solve uh, some more human focused problems or using them to understand the environments and potential dangers. So uh, as biocontrol agents, Dragonflies and damselflies both prey on mosquitoes and pests. Uh, mosquitoes are also aquatic insects as well. So they're being hunted by dragonflies and damselflies in both life stages. And there's a there's a recent meta-analysis or one that looked across multiple studies on um, dragonfly and damselfly predation on mosquitoes uh, that found that there is a tractable effect on how much they can control those populations. So there is potential for using um, these organisms as biocontrol in the future. So. Um, introducing them to areas in order to control the populations of mosquitoes. And so my research will essentially help us um, get a better insight into predicting the diet of some of those harder to observe species, ones that we can't quite um, uh, track the way that they do things. And so basically that means that there's areas in which I'll be able to fill in the gap for my own curiosity, but also ways in which we can understand if there are certain species that uh, kind of supporting the populations of might actually also um, benefit and reduce uh, mosquito-borne disease. But then as aquatic insects themselves, uh, dragonflies and damselflies are really vulnerable to um, things that invade our water supplies. And so they're really sensitive to things that would disturb those water sources. And uh, they can also accumulate toxins and things that uh, end up in the water because as predators, they're eating other small things that might also be affected and then accumulating that within themselves. And so getting a better understanding there is also really important uh, because if they're not doing well, then we're probably not gonna be doing well. And so I kind of want to just end off the, the talk with some really cool cultural representations of dragonflies um, throughout history. So there's a, a lot of uh, representations of dragonflies and uh, devils. So the devil in, in some cultures having been a representation, or sorry, dragonflies in some cultures being a representation for the devil in some capacity. This is supposed to be a portrait of uh, Jesus holding a um, dragonfly and containing the devil. Um, there's a kind of closer up on what that looks like. Um, and so
so there's uh, some German nicknames, uh, the Hexenvogel or the Witch's Bird and the Himmelsiga or the Sky Goat that refer to these kind of devil superstitions. Um, and then the Skams Besman or the Devil Steelyard in Swedish is another common name for dragonflies uh, that represents that they're a scale that the devil used to weigh people's souls. So a dragonfly flying around you is uh, determining the weight of your, your soul and can be a bad omen um, in some cases. But there's a lot of positive ones too. So dragonflies can be associated with luck. Um, they're known as the katsumishi or the invincible insect in Japan because of their association with success and victory. For samurai, they represented courage, strength, and manliness. Um, and in particular, the autumn darter is a um, culturally important uh, species in Japan as well. They're also associated with change and rebirth. So they're used to explain death and reincarnation in some cultures. Uh, the recent Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Amongst Thieves, used a sapphire dragonfly that represented uh, reincarnation and letting go of the past, um, although they called it a dragonfly the whole time, and it was very clear that it was a damselfly, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and then there's a uh, book called King and the Dragonflies by Case and Calendar, and it uh, uses dragonflies as a representation of symbolized grief and personal growth, but also um, carries some reincarnation elements. And then there's just a lot of cool different names and things that uh, dragonflies have. So um, the Hexenvogel that I mentioned before, which is the witch's bird, and the Cavalito del Diablo, um, which means little horse of the devil. And for a long time, some people thought that dragonflies were spies for witches or the devil itself. Um, the devil's darning needle is another one. Um, that's one of the more uh, widespread common names that they have. And it refers to dragonflies or damselflies. Um, being uh, something that kids have to watch out for because if the kids misbehave, then they'll come and sew their mouths shut while they're sleeping. Then there's the snake doctor um, that says that uh, some myths that if you chop up a snake into pieces, uh, the snake doctor is the dragonfly that will fly in and stitch it back up. So really specific things there. And then um, I think the, this is the last one I have on here, but uh, the horse stinger. Uh, so the presence of dragonflies around um, like some irritated or uh, crazy misbehaved horses. Uh, it was thought that the dragonflies were influencing them in some way. Um, but if we take a little bit of an ecological insight, uh, it kind of makes sense why people would think that. But if a horse is not having a good day, it's probably because it's got some biting flies on it. Um, and that happens to be dragonflies' favorite foods. So um, they're actually there because of the problem, not as the problem. So. Um, and then there's a, a very recent Bigfoot connection that's also got some close proximity to UC Davis as well, a uh, recent story from about 20-ish years ago. Um, it's a little too lengthy to go into during the talk, but uh, I think there's an old uh, news article um, from the Bohart that discusses it about a, someone that thought Bigfoot was real and ate dragonfly larvae and only dragonfly larvae and a lot more wild things related. Um, and so lastly, just want to end off with a couple of online resources and uh, some books and things in case people have become more interested and not exhausted by me talking about dragonflies for an hour straight. So uh, there's a world Odonata list that has an update on the species um, that I recognized. Um, all 6,406 species of dragonflies, damselflies, and dragon damsels are on there. Then there's the Odonate phenotypic database that is an open source thing that takes information from publications and other things um, to keep a record of the colors, behaviors, and body measurements of different species. And so you can basically look up just about any species and get some kind of information back from it. We don't have all of that information. Again, there are plenty of those families that I went through where I didn't really have much to say because I don't know about them and other people don't really know about them. So it's something that is constantly being updated, but I'm hoping one day we'll be able to just look up any species of dragonfly and know exactly what's going on. Um, so for some fun reading, um, there's a couple kind of more uh, not scientific heavy uh, books about dragonflies, including some field guides here. Um, in particular, I used uh, these three really heavily to put this talk together. Um, Jill Silsby's Dragonflies of the World is about 20 years old now. Um, so some of its things are a little out of date, but it's still a treasure trove of information. Every time I open it, I keep telling myself I need to read it more often. Um, Dragonflies and Damselflies, A Natural History by Dennis Paulson is uh, one of the more recent ones. And I think the perfect kind of in-between um, book for people just wanting to learn about dragonflies. There's so much that I benefited um, learning about it as a researcher when I first started graduate school, but I think I've bought this book about seven times um, as gifts to people. And then uh, 
down over here in the bottom is a uh, spinning Jenny and the devil's darning needle. Um, and that's uh, one that I got a lot of the cultural representation stuff from. It's a really cool book and I think very much worth a read. And then these three field guides are great if you decide that you want to go out and identify some dragonflies and start to learn about them. Uh, the Dragonflies and Damselflies of California by Tim Manolis is the most specific of them, um, but it is also, I think, almost 20 years old now. So there's a couple of things that are going to be a little bit outdated, just some names of some um, genera and species, but otherwise, uh, all three of them are phenomenal. And then if you're really into science and thinking about studying or just learning more specifics about dragonflies, um, I'd highly recommend these five books. Um, these three in particular, this is the from 2019, the only real comprehensive guide on identifying and understanding dragonfly nymphs. They're very cryptically colored, so it's hard to tell them apart. But um, if there's anything we know about doing that, it's going to be in here. This is a very recent one for studying dragonflies and the concept of uh, ecology and evolution um, and is very, very up to date. I think it's only me, not even two years old now. Um, and then over on the left, we have Behavior and Ecology of Odonata by Philip Corbett, who's kind of the godfather of odonatology, or what we'd call the study of dragonflies and damselflies specifically. And it's, uh, it was published in 1999, but it was a second edition, and it is a massive book. It is basically the dragonfly Bible, if we were to have one. Um, and there's just so much in it, and every time I open it, I'm forgetting just how much there is. But it's also, I think, about five or 600 pages long. Um, and then these two here in the middle are um, keys for identifying adult dragonflies. So if you can't tell immediately from the colors and you're really having difficulty figuring them out, these are perfect for that. And there's a lot of information in there too. Um, and so with that, I just want to give a special thanks to some people that have really helped me over uh, my entire academic journey. Um, lots of my lab mates, um, people at the Bohart Museum uh, that I use for research, um, the uh, um, Center for Molecular and Genomic Imaging at Davis, where I did my CT scans, um, my committee members uh, for my qualifying exam and dissertation committee, um, and of course, the dragonflies that I've talked about all day today. Um, and so I just want to end this off with a, a quote I came up with a couple weeks ago that really kind of emphasizes my view in life, which is that I know nada except Odonata, uh, but I think I know Odonata pretty well. Uh, and so with that, uh, I think if you have any questions for me, I will happily take them. Uh, here's my contact information if you think of them later or would like to talk to me outside of this. Um, and thank you again to the Yolo Basin Foundation for having me. Well, really, really appreciated your presentation, Christopher. That was a lot packed in and a uh, real you know, depth and breadth of information. Um, I'll turn it over to Billy. There's some questions in the chat and um, we'll go to those. And if you've got some, just type them in. If you've got any other comments for Christopher, um, you can also like, there's like those reaction things that you can, you can send off. So Billy, why don't you see what questions people have asked? Yeah, thank you so much, Christopher. Um, so we do have a couple of questions in the chat. And like Martha said, if you have any more, please feel free to type them out. Um, so D asks, is there a way to identify how they get their specific color, habitat, prey, like, prey type, length of larva, life, et cetera? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's a couple different mechanisms by which like color is determined in insects. Um, and I think there are definitely some animals that like will get their like color source from the things that they eat. Dragonflies are not one of those. Um, so blue is a very common color within dragonflies. Um, and there's like a couple different ways that that's measured. Um, one of them is like there's bodies that are what we call prunos. And it's the way that it reflects light in a way that there's like kind of an absence of things. And it gives this kind of light blue color. Um, and I might be butchering the way that that actually functions. Um, and then there's like some pigments that get into like a really deep blue. Um, and so there's tons of different species of damselflies that are just like awesome variation of blue with black stripes. And it's kind of the first time I gave this talk, I showed up a, a slide that basically was all just those kinds of damselflies. And I was like, I promise you, there are like four species of damselflies on the slide. They're not all the same. Um, but so I don't know that there are any that come from like um, food consumption stuff, but um, they tend to just, yeah, there's, it's an interesting thing to look at color in um, organisms and like where that comes from, because there are a lot that have like very particular modes of it. And I think in dragonflies, it really is just species recognition is all that we've been able to, to tell. So just like knowing what's actually the species that you're trying to mate with or trying to like defend against um, if you're looking for mating opportunities. And that's about it. So sorry, it's not a more uh, comprehensive answer. 
No, that was great. Nicole asks, do they lay their eggs in standing water like mosquitoes, like around our yards or in a more, or do they lay them in a more wild setting? Um, so a little bit of both, actually. Um, there are some, uh, I know, I think I just noticed that Nicole had their hand raised, but um, there are some species that will lay it on anything that vaguely looks like water. So you can see a kind of, see some trying to lay their eggs uh, on a like damp driveway. Um, there are some that will try to lay them on solar panels because they kind of reflect that. Um, in a lot of different organisms, like the cues that they need to determine um, certain things are just like the bare minimum. So like that reflective surface, you really wouldn't normally see on anything but water, but a lot of urban things have kind of thrown that off. There are a couple that will specifically lay it in standing water. So I mentioned it uh, briefly, but there's some that'll lay them in something that's, it's called a phytotelmata, which is a really complicated word that is basically just a plant that has a water cavity in it. Um, and so ones that will lay it there will also lay them in like tree holes that have like, or sorry, uh, yeah, tree holes that are filled with water. And those tend to be damselflies that will do that, but then they'll kind of grow up and be the, the only thing top dog in that really, really tiny aquatic environment. But um, I would say if you have like standing water uh, in places that mosquitoes can lay their eggs, I would just dump them out because it's not, not worth waiting for a dragonfly to come along. Great, thank you. Yeah, oh, and I guess just to, to elaborate more, uh, there are some that will lay them directly into aquatic vegetation um, or like deep into the water. There's some that kind of like almost submerge themselves to do that. Um, so. Great. Kat asks their ability to predict when and where they'll pr their prey will be, as opposed to tracking directly. Is there an easy breezy way to explain that ability to children? Um, there is, um, I unfortunately just start thinking of all of the complicated papers that I've read, but, um, yeah, so there's, uh, kind of two different, there's like kind of chasing and then like interception. And so dragonflies will mostly like detect where their prey is and kind of where they're going and they'll line themselves up to basically predict where, um, their prey is going to be so that they can intercept them and cut their path off rather than just exhaustingly chasing them and reacting to them. So. Um, and that's part of the decisions that they're trying to make when they're, especially in those percher species, when they've got prey coming by and when they're deciding if they're going to actually hunt for it. And there's whole like things of like logic and physics that uh, kind of govern that process. Um, but essentially, rather than just chase something after seeing it and waiting until it moves to know if you're going to move or not, it tends to just kind of follow it down um, and uh, predict where it's going to be so that they can be there first. Great. Ken asks, what's up with spread wings? Since they do not seem to be numerous around here, what is the advantage of being a spread wing? That is a very good question. Um, I have some uh, papers by um, uh, one of my committee members and uh, a great mentor and uh, loving dragonflies uh, named Dennis Paulson. And he did a lot of stuff studying the spread wings. Um, so I would have to check on some of those. But um, I know there's if I were to, to think of some things, again, I don't actually know any of this for sure. I would expect that like there could be something on um, like mating displays, but also on uh, something on thermoregulation, kind of absorbing more um, heat from the sun and having that wider surface area so that they can suck up that um, heat. That's a large part of that I didn't mention today is, is like thermoregulation and like controlling your temperature is a large part of what determines if a dragonfly is going to be um, a percher or a flyer. So perchers tend to be able to still hunt at hotter temperatures because they can passively get their heat from the sun and then stay in the shade when they don't want to be too hot. But the flyers generate their own heat from their flight muscles. And so they actually are really prone to getting uh, exhausted and, and overheated. And so I think two years ago, almost, um, there were tons and tons of green darners just dead on the ground when we had the, the heat wave in Davis of 113 degrees. It was really fascinating. Um, but so, yeah, that's about all I've got on the, um, I guess I'm, I'm assuming that you mean spread wings as in the, the spread wing damselflies because there's a group that kind of doesn't quite fall into the, the category. But um, otherwise for the dragonflies, I think it's just they're better flyers for sure. By comparison, the damselflies tend to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more clumsy in their flight, um, but still far more majestic than most other insects. Great. This question came in earlier while you were talking about dragonfly nymphs. You had used the phrase gradual metamorphosis, and I think Pat was hoping you could elaborate a bit on that. 
Uh, got you. Um, yeah, I don't remember specifically saying gradual metamorphosis. That is definitely not a keyword I was trying to deposit. But um, basically, when they hit their last uh, developmental stage, or what we call an instar in insects, um, they are kind of undergoing um, their their like uh, maturation to their adult in um, basically within their baby skin. Um, that was a really weird way of phrasing that. I'm sorry, but um, they're basically uh, kind of undergoing those changes so that when they're ready to emerge, they can crawl right out and start that process as soon as possible. Um, and so, yeah, um, in general, insects undergo what we call discrete development. Um, so they have to like shed their skin and molt um, in between each of their developmental periods. So inside of their hard exoskeleton that protects them from the world, they're growing, but that exoskeleton is too rigid to allow them to get bigger while they're wearing it still. And so they have to, to size up um, every time. And so they're always growing in between those different stages, but they're just doing the most drastic changes in between um, that last one. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so dragonflies undergo what we call uh, incomplete metamorphosis. So they're what we call hemimetabolous insects. So they go straight from their larvae to their adult. So they don't have this pupil stage that we see in like beetles or in um, flies or in butterflies. Um, so if you think of a caterpillar going into a cocoon and then into a butterfly, um, dragonflies don't have that middle step. And so they don't actually get to rearrange their body nearly as much by comparison. And so, um, uh, instead, they kind of go directly to the um, adult stage. And so one of the benefits that we see in uh, what we call that complete metamorphosis in like beetles and flies and stuff is that they can separate the environments that are inhabited by um, their larval and adult stage. So like most of the beetles and things tend to be like in trees or in the ground, and then the adults do stuff elsewhere. Um, but dragonflies actually don't need to be undergo complete metamorphosis to do that because, again, they separate their entire life stage into water and air. So great, thank you. Of course. Julie asks, what are the reason for dragonfly swarms? There was a swarm last year in Quincy, California. Uh that's a good question. Um, so there's a blog by someone called the Dragonfly Woman, and I think I didn't keep too much track of it. Um, but there was a like citizen science project on um kind of notifying when and where dragonfly swarms are happening so that they can study them. Um, there's two main uh, reasons that come to mind immediately for me, which is uh, migration. So there's several different species that will migrate in unison with each other, which is especially interesting because dragonflies are solitary insects. They don't have any social dynamics. They don't work with each other on things. Um, but the common green darner is one that we have that does that. Um, the variegated meadowhawk, Sympetrum corruptum, does that as well. Um, and then we get... Uh, Two species, the two species of gliders here in Davis, uh, on occasion to the wandering glider, Pantala flavescens, and Pantala hymenea, the spot wing glider, and those will go kind of all around the world, essentially, um, and so they'll do that kind of with each other, and not really sure exactly how or why they do that. Um, the other reason being that when other insects kind of swarm around um, in mass, that tends to be when they're mating, and so dragonflies will kind of time their um, flights to match that, and so then you can see swarms of tons and tons of insects, and then you'll have five different species of dragonflies all preying on them, um, which is especially impressive because most other predators would get confused or um, do po more poorly in uh, basically being surrounded by so many prey options that they have to try and figure out which one is the best. But dragonflies really invested all of their uh, evolutionary points, I guess you could say, um, into their vision. And so they're really able to pick things out very easily. And so that's also why they they tend to be so good at what they do that they just kind of all gather and do it and don't get in each other's way. All right, thank you so much. That's the last of the questions from the chat. So I'm gonna turn it over to Martha. Well, I wanna thank, uh, thank you again, Christopher. That was awesome. Of course. And I wanna thank everybody who's uh, still on. Um, we ended up with over 50 people on tonight. So that was fantastic. Um, Love to hear from those of you who have ideas for our speaker series. We've got, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got Garrett Spann, who's the new area manager for the wildlife area uh, next month. And then uh, we're collecting more ideas for the future. So if you like the, you know, about our creatures or about different things that are going on in the wildlife area, we just love to respond to the interests of our community. So thanks again, Christopher. Thanks for all of you for coming and uh, we'll see you soon.